Why do we care about the will of God in our decision making? I think it's pretty simple, isn't it? We'd much rather be aligned with God's will than be fighting God's will, because that's a losing battle, isn't it? There's no winning when you fight against what God wants to do and to accomplish. And so we go throughout our lives asking this question time and time again. How do we know that what we're doing is according to God's will? And especially around those big decisions. We want to be aligned with God's will for us. There's a, a peace and a joy in knowing that. Paul's journey really has some really interesting things for us to look at. Interesting aspects of what's happening uh, in these few verses that give us some indicators of how God's will can be demonstrated to us and help us with our decision making. But, we, but before we get to the text today, I want to recap some of the details from last week that we looked at, um, because it provides a background for Paul's journey. And I think there's some lessons there that are uh, pertinent to this question of God's will in decision making. And how do we align our decision making with the will of God? So just to quickly recap from last week. Paul and Barnabas have a plan. They have a plan to revisit the churches that they planted on their first missionary journey. You know, they've been there, they've done that, they've introduced the gospel, people have responded, churches have been planted. They've got a plan, it's time for us to go back. Not only to share the letters from the apostles from Jerusalem about, you know, how the Jews should be uh, living and acting, and we'll visit those again briefly, but we just want to check up on them. We want to see how God is working and continuing to work in their lives. And that's a great plan, don't you think? I'm sure they were convinced this is the will of God for us, that we go back and do this. We go back and we visit. But it doesn't turn out really smoothly, does it? They have this sharp disagreement between the two of them uh, about taking Mark along with them. And, and Paul's kind of upset because, you know, like Mark started the journey with us, but he quit halfway. And so I'm not sure I want to drag him along with me again. And uh, so the plan changes and they part company. Barnabas takes Mark and they set sail for Cyprus. And then Paul takes Silas, who was one of the prophets that came with him from Jerusalem, and they head out to share the letter written by the leaders, and they head out by land in a different direction. And this is what it looked like. That was Paul's first missionary journey that him and Barnabas went on. They left from Antioch, sailed down through Cyprus, visited some places there, planted some churches, got back on a boat, went up into Pamphylia, and then toured around a bit in Asia and planted those churches there. Came back by boat and landed there. So for Barnabas, he takes Mark and he does the same thing. He follows the same path. I'm going from Antioch to Cyprus and going to visit the churches there. And it shouldn't surprise us because Barnabas, we're told in the scriptures, was from Cyprus. It was like going home. This was the comfort place for him to go to continue. But he takes and he follows the pattern of what we did the first time. Paul, on his second missionary journey, he does the opposite thing. He leaves from Antioch and he heads out the opposite direction by land into Asia to visit these churches. They alter their plans to go in different directions. And sometimes, you know, we have this feeling when we see sharp disagreements that people break a relationship. I like to think of this. 
that they got to the point where, you know what, we can't agree about whether to take Mark or Long or not. So you want to take Mark, go ahead and do that, and I bless you. God go use you and Mark as you revisit the churches. And I'm sure Barnabas blessed Paul as he went a different direction. Because although the plans changed, the heart of what their purpose was, was so aligned with the gospel and presenting the gospel and the purposes of God that they overcame their differences. And when we read about the relationship that Paul ultimately develops with Mark, we realize, you know, our perceptions of, oh, when you have a disagreement, it breaks relationship, isn't necessarily the case. So what's the outcome of their disagreement? People changed. The teams were different now. Instead of one team, now there was two teams. You had Paul and Barnabas, and then another team that's, I mean, Barnabas and Mark. Now there's another team of Paul and Silas and Timothy. In the context of the gospel, that's probably good, isn't it? You go from one team to two teams. That's multiplication. It's adding more people to the ministry. The direction changed somewhat in that Barnabas and Mark headed off and sailed south. Paul, Silas headed out to the northwest, taking the road to Derby and Lystra. Those were the last churches that they meted, they met at, and developed and planted in their first trip. So rather than having a long trip, you actually get somewhere quicker. Those churches get the feedback and the leadership and the guidance from Paul and Silas because they go the other way. They go through the back way to those churches and they get there sooner and their fellowship is enriched. And the activity changes. Now we don't know much about Paul, uh, Barnabas, is, it's hard to keep these guys split up because you're so used to saying Paul and Barnabas, but Barnabas and Mark, we don't have a lot of details about what their ministry was on Cyprus and how effective it was. Not the same as the stories we have about Paul and his journeys and multiple journeys and then the letters that he wrote to the churches. But one thing that does happen is that the purpose of revisiting the churches that they first planted gets extended by Paul. It's now just not kind of, oh, we've been here, done that, we're going back to reaffirm what we've done and reaffirm those churches, and, and we're, we're wanting to share the letter from the apostles because that was part of the journey. Their activity changes and, and they go beyond where they originally intended. And that's not the only outcome of the disagreement. Many things changed. Many things changed in terms of people, direction, activities, expanded. But one thing didn't change, and that was the purpose of the mission aligned around the purposes of God, the preaching of the gospel. That was their only reason for going, because they were aligned with God's message and his message that he wanted to be shared. The growth of the church took place, as we read, and the strengthening of the church took place. And the discipleship of two very young believers both Mark and Timothy, were outcomes from this disagreement that sent people in different directions. Proverbs tells us many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Some of our challenges around this, I think, and some of the challenges we have with this question or is that we often think this way and we're, we're kind of brought into this through community and the culture that we live in and it's, there's a real focus on myself. 
making decisions that are good for me. And sometimes that's what we get to in the church. We want to make decisions that are good for me personally, but I also want to see us make good decisions for us as a church. And so we go about thinking about what impact does it have for me? And our hope is that as we make decisions and start to live them out, our prayer and hope is that God will bless them. We, we put our desires at the forefront of this equation and we go, God, we're, I'm, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. I think we should do this collectively. Will you bless it? And I think the opposite of that is really what God calls us to. He calls us to know him and to know his purposes and then align our lives and the life of our church around that. So we put God first in these things as opposed to what we tend to have been socialized into doing is to thinking about where do I go for a career? Where do I go live? Ray, I really appreciate you sharing this morning. You've brought a whole new meaning to being moved by the Spirit to me. Moved from Edmonton to Drayton, moved by, from Drayton back to Edmonton, and now moved, I'm sure, by the Spirit to come be in KW and be part of our fellowship. So if you need any moving advice, Ray would probably be the guy to talk to. But we want to put God first and his purposes. And so that brings us to our text today. Because it picks up from where does Paul go from that point in time? So it tells us in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, that Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. And the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Now this is the same Timothy who Paul would later write two books to, two letters to, uh, that we find in the New Testament. And, you know, he's, he's kind of um, talk about mixed marriages, right? And some of the challenges that that, that brings. We, we still see that today culturally. Um, he's the product of a mixed marriage, a, a father who was a Greek and a mother who was a Jew. And normally that wouldn't be the case. It, culturally, it was just completely wrong for somebody to marry outside their faith, certainly for a Jew to be married to someone that is a Greek. And so um, he's in this kind of, and they say it's really probably because the Jewish community wasn't very large or, you know, affect like, uh, have a lot of influence in that community, that his mom was even allowed to marry a Greek person. So here's Timothy, the same person that... Um, we read about who has this real heritage, family heritage of faith. His grandmother, we learn about Lois, and his mother Eunice, believers. Him learning the scriptures from infancy. He's been raised in his family as a Jew. But everybody else in the community knows that his father's a Greek. And so he's kind of this misfit in some respects, in his own community, but people still spoke well of him. His character, maybe. Maybe what he did as he lived a life of faith in that community. But everybody spoke well of him. So in some respects, he's kind of stepped out beyond some of the setbacks that he would normally have experienced as being in this mixed family. Goes on and tells us Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. Couldn't take Mark, but I'm ready to take Timothy. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And so the churches were strengthened 
in faith and grew daily in number. Time out. Doesn't, doesn't as you read this story, don't, don't you call for a time out here? Because the whole, most of the 15th chapter of Acts was about what? Believers don't have to be circumcised, right? Believers don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And yet here's Paul, a leader in the church, going, I want to take you with me, but before you go, you have to be circumcised. Now, if I'm Timothy, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, is this the will of God for my life? He had a big decision to make. And so we, we, we ask ourselves, like, why, why that when, you know, that's, we've just spent the whole chapter before talking about this is unnecessary for salvation. So why circumcise, Timothy? Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. We know that's not the case for him because he's a believer already. And so all the church had told them to share the news was this. Do these things. Abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. He was probably doing that and following that. Why be circumcised? Well, we probably have a bit of a history if we look back on church of not just being missionaries of the gospel, but sometimes more than that, being missionaries of culture. Missionaries of culture. Where we not only take the gospel to people, but we take our culture. And we try to change their culture because it should fit like us. How many of you have traveled to Africa and gone to some African churches or to South America. What's church like on a Sunday morning? People wearing white shirts and ties? That's just one example of transferring a culture along with the gospel. Think of our history, and it's very complicated, but as we think about the residential school system here in Canada, how much of that was sharing the gospel with indigenous people as opposed to it was forcing indigenous people to accept a different culture? And that's really what Paul's dealing with here. Here is Mark, uh, here is Timothy, this person that's kind of lost in the middle. And he needs to find a cultural identity that won't get in the way of the gospel. And I think when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we see where the heart of Paul was and why it made sense for Timothy to be circumcised. Paul wrote, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Anchored in God's purposes for his kingdom. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. And though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. To do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Circumcision or Timothy not being circumcised would have gotten in the way of their traveling together because they probably went to Jewish homes when they went to a new city, a new town, and looked for people that would accept them. And Timothy wouldn't be accepted as part of that. So I think the lesson for us 
is to think a little bit about how do we enter into and are sensitive to the cultures of people around us. We live in a multicultural community. And as a church, we want to reach that community. We need to be aware that some of the things that we do and choices that we've made may very well just get in the way culturally of what would prevent people from hearing us, from hearing the gospel. And so that's why Timothy was circumcised before they went further on this journey and he joined Paul and Silas. So now they have another choice to make. We want to move on. We want to move on. So in verse 6, we pick up Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And when they came to the border of, of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So let's go back and visit our map a little bit. Now, the, the first thing I recognized when I saw this map was, you know, down in this right bottom corner, they had been in Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And then they headed west. Now, where they got to this little notch where there's like a bit of a loop at the bottom there, they, they could have turned south again and gone down to Pamphylia, got on a boat and gone back to Cyprus. That was the churches that they'd visited. That, that would be the loop, right? Just going backwards around that first journey. But they don't. They turn and they move on. And they move on, and you don't see any cities there. Now, I'm sure there were some small towns and villages, but, you know, they kept moving on. And, and we get to this little point that's circled in black there where they, where they seem to get to a point where they can't go any further. They were hoping to preach the gospel along the way, but somehow were prevented. Doesn't tell us why, from any practical kind of reasoning. It wasn't that there was opposition to the gospel, because we'll see as we go on through the book of Acts, there's all kinds of opposition that they face, and that doesn't keep them from preaching the gospel, but somehow along this journey, they're prevented from preaching the gospel. And then they reach this point where they, they want to continue north up through Asia towards the Black Sea, and, and they can't cross this border. I doubt it was an issue with a passport or a visa. Maybe it was springtime and there was a flooded river that formed the border and they couldn't cross. But what they identified, that there was a spiritual component to what was going on as they traveled. And it was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that was pre preventing them and keeping them from preaching the gospel in this province. And then it was the Spirit of Jesus who would not allow them to go further into Asia to preach the gospel. Now, if it was me or you, would, would you not find that frustrating? Here we are, we're on this journey. We've walked miles and miles to preach the gospel and haven't been able to do it, haven't been able to see it happen. And I might have been able to, as I come back down that road, head back left again and go back down to where I've been. But, but Paul, they come down and they turn right and they keep heading further west. Even though it's been you know, just a very difficult journey in terms of accomplishing the gospel. And the interesting thing is that they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas, which was that city right over on the coast again. And maybe in the back of their mind they were thinking, Let's get there. We can get on a boat and go home. But they kept moving and moving forward. And so we read as they pass by, they get to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, 
come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, it tells us that we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, the vision only came to Paul. But as he shared it, the group with him, which likely included Luke now, and that's what they take from the reference of we, He's the author of this book, but he says, now we decided at once to follow the vision that Paul had been given and to go over because we know that this is still aligned with the purposes of God and what he's calling us to do is to go and to preach the gospel to them. I just want to revisit the map again. I hope you can read some of the cities that they went to after they left Troas. Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, and it's not on the map, but Colossae. Do those cities sound familiar at all? Paul wrote to them later, and it makes up the large part of our New Testament revelation of Jesus and God. Sometimes God works in ways that we don't understand. They're difficult. They're challenging. But he wants to fulfill his purposes. And so I'd like to suggest just three things that we can take from this. And I've got to be finished in two more minutes, according to Gord. Sometimes I believe that God uses a closed door to help us understand that he wants to redirect us. That what we've been doing, what we've been attempting to do, what we've been hoping to do, maybe God has something else in store for us. There's a closed door. But I also think that God wants us to keep moving. I don't think he expects us just to sit and go, well, I'm just going to wait here. I'm just going to wait here and not do anything till God really reveals and I can't, you know, ignore him that this is what I should do. You heard the expression that you can't steer a, a vehicle that's not moving. And so I think for Paul, there, you know, if you, you go that whole journey, you know, from Iconium west, up and down and back and forth until he gets to Troas, it's only there that he receives the vision from God of this man in Macedonia saying, get on a boat and cross the sea to Macedonia. He kept moving. And the other thing is, I think you respond to opportunities that God brings to you. Be prepared to respond to those opportunities. Now, God will speak to us in many different ways, but we need to be ready to respond. There's a verse in Jeremiah 31, 33, and it's a new covenant that God promises for his people Israel, and this is just a part of it. He said, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will put my law in their minds and write it upon their hearts, and it will, I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's the place we always need to start if we want to discern God's will for us, is knowing him, knowing his heart for us, his purposes, and to follow them. We always need to start with God, not with my will, and ask him to confirm it just with his blessing. We want to start with his will and know that he will confirm it by blessing it as we follow. I just want to end with this last slide. <clears throat> this is the text from the first sermon that I spoke when I came to Grace. You know, that real long one that, Ed, you'll remind me of was 56 minutes. Um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. It's been a journey for us to get to this place today. When we're finished with this sermon, we'll be sitting and taking time to understand and communicate and talk about God's purpose for us as a church. And so one of the things that we spent a ton of time on as leadership teams and larger conversations with people is understanding a mission, a vision, and the values that we want to live out as a church. And so the conversation we're going to have afterwards is very much about doing a couple of things that we believe align with God's purposes for his church. And so that's what we're going to be doing afterwards. And that's where our heart is and has been as a leadership group, has always been following and seeking God's wisdom about his purposes for his church. And I'm two minutes over, so let me stop and pray. Father, thank you for your leading and guiding in the life of Paul from that day when you came to him on the road to Damascus and asked him why he was persecuting you. And you turned his life around and he followed you. And we can share in that journey and we'll continue to share in that journey over the next few weeks. And so, Father, we thank you for bringing us together as Belmont Village Church. Father, for continuing to reveal your purposes for us. And Father, might we have the wisdom to follow you, to say yes and amen to where you call and lead us to in the future. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory, not ours. Amen.